Okay, so everybody, welcome back. Let's uh, give a warm welcome to Tenzin Ramgala. Well, okay, so why are we having a, a visiting guest speaker today? Well, so the, from the very beginning of our course, or of the intro course, so we have students from the other course I see as well, but in the intro course we've been discussing the relationship of quantum mechanics with the philosophy of the middle way, right? Which is really, in the Tibet tradition, how we identify the clearest and most refined analysis of reality, of what reality is. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama has, uh, which by now all of the interest students know is my favorite person <laughs> in the world, so the fa my most cited person. So he very, very, um, high, it has a very high regard for quantum mechanics. He's studied uh, under, you know, directly with, uh, you know, expert quantum physicists, Carl Weisiger and David Bohm, etc. And he also really explains how and describes how the uh, writings of Nagarjuna, which we've also gone over, right, the main author that founded the Middle Way School, Nagarjuna. Uh, the, the views and the, the logic expressed uh, in those teachings and writings is exactly the same as the conclusions arrived at by quantum mechanics. So, uh, so we have here a quantum physicist <laughs> who is, uh, so just a brief introduction, background. So Denzel Ramgala actually grew up here in Dharamsala, attended the TCV school, which is right below where we went yesterday, where we had the stupa walk, the, the main boarding school for the Tibetan youth is right down the hill from there. And then he uh, went to uh, another TCV in Teradun, and then a specialty science school in the south of India to finish his 12th grade. And then uh, studied his undergrad in quantum physics at MIT in Massachusetts, US. And then the graduate was in the Michigan State University, right? Okay, correct me if I'm wrong about anything. Michigan State University, also in the US, and then uh, he completed his uh, doctoral research there and now is a researcher at Seoul National University in South Korea. Uh, his main area of research is uh, Bose-Einstein condensates and essentially uh, researching atomic physics. So what is an atom, what's in an atom, how do atoms work? So that's his area of research, but he's also a very serious student of Buddhist philosophy. So uh, this is why I thought it would be appropriate to hear from him, and also in general, because you've been hearing from me this week, uh, or you guys from Venerable Wangdu, but we're both monks, right? And none of you are. <laughs> monks are nuns. So you're, you're all lay people, but you know, you also need to understand and come away with something that you can, a way you can practice in your daily lives. And so here is another lay person, a fellow uh, Dharma brother, who can uh, share a bit about how he thinks of study and practice in his life. Also, you know, he has a family, a wife, and children, so it's um, a very busy life, but still manages to do a very serious study of Buddhist philosophy. Okay, so I'll pass the mic over, and we'll have time for, for Q&A as well. And just a reminder, uh, after this session, we're still in silence, even though we'll have the opportunity for Q&A during the session. Okay, thank you, Rao Gala. Please go ahead. Okay, can everybody hear me at the back? Audible? Okay, good. Uh, so let me begin by saying that it is a tremendous pleasure to be here. Although I grew up in this neighborhood, this is my first time at Tushita. Uh, I used to go play soccer at, you know, what is now Hyatt Hotel. There used to be a field there. <laughs> the local kids used to go play soccer there, football as we call it. Uh, and um, we used to pass by Tushita, but obviously never occurred to us that we could actually come here too. <laughs> um, so it's really lovely to be here and in this company of people who are very, very much invested in, you know, Dharma practice, studying this very wonderful tradition. Uh, let me also begin by saying that I have absolutely no qualification whatsoever to speak to you guys. So whatever I'm saying today is purely based on my own very limited exposure, very limited practice of this wonderful tradition. 
And in some sense, I'll also be speaking from a, a perspective of a physicist, you know, how I engage with dharma. So uh, it might, uh, you know, resonate with some of you, might not, uh, and we can bring it up for question <laughs> later on. Um, so as, uh, you know, Venerable Tunila pointed out, I um, did most of my formative, you know, schooling here in Dharamshala. And as a Tibetan uh, child, it is very difficult for you to not be exposed to, you know, Buddhism, as you might imagine. Uh, but because Buddhism is so prevalent all around you, you don't really take it that seriously, unfortunately. You know, unlike some of the people here, you know. Uh, and because of that, Buddhism, at least, you know, in, in, in my experience, kind of became part of my culture. Um, part of my day-to-day -day life and not something that I paid a lot of, you know, uh, attention to. Um, I think it started changing when I was in high school and I, you know, and, um, you know, for, for many different reasons, somehow in the Tibetan language curriculum in Tibetan schools, you're also taught Buddhist philosophy. Now, we might debate whether that's a good idea or not. But that was my uh, formal introduction to Buddhist philosophy. And, you know, I remember I was in my class and obviously our Tibetan language teacher was a monk. <laughs> and he taught us about, he was teaching us about emptiness, you know, to a bunch of high schoolers, ninth graders. He was teaching us about how <laughs> the desk that we were, you know, we had in front of us, the, the wooden desk, did not really exist the way we see it. <laughs> and obviously, you know, many of us were startled by it. <laughs> we were surprised that, you know, uh, that he would say such a thing. Um, we did not understand any of his reasonings as to why the death did not exist the way we saw it. Uh, but that was my introduction to Buddhist philosophy. <laughs> um, and Part of the uh, education also incorporated the Buddhist, the debating technique that you see in the monastery. So we would debate on topics ranging from, of course, Buddhism, but we would then, you know, um, end up talking about physics and math. And somehow things got heavily intertwined. <laughs> like we found that we could use the same, you know, analytical techniques uh, for studying, you know, what was used for studying Buddhist texts in the Tibetan monasteries to studying some of these, you know, other subjects uh, that we were being taught. And at the same time, um, I think around the time I was in, yeah, in high school, we had um, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, monastics from different monasteries uh, and nunneries. They came to my school for a month and there were also a, uh, you know, some very, well-known uh, Western scientists came to our school for a month long, what was then called Science for Monks and Nuns. So they would teach them science and math and they would you know, debate about you know, the philosophical concepts, all that. And as a high schooler, I was really mesmerized that there, is, that, <laughs> that there even is this common ground where Buddhism and science could meet at all. Because my impression of Buddhism had always been that it was a religion and you know, I had my own implicit biases as to what religion entailed. And so I always saw it as something that was opposed to the scientific method, you know. And much of my you know, classmates probably did as well. So we were very surprised that these people were gathering to talk about something they had in common or to, you know, something they disagreed about. But they were interested in hearing each other's opinions, you know. And then I started paying attention, obviously, to the Mind and Life conferences that, you know, they organized and I saw, um, you know, there was this great interest in studying science and learning about what science has to say about, you know, the world that we live in. Uh, driven mostly by His Holiness, of course, um, but then a lot of the monastics, you know, the, the nuns and the monks were taking interest in it. And they were having very deep and insightful discussions about some of the fundamental topics in quantum mechanics that I did not understand at that point, obviously. But it did light a spark in me that, okay, I, I have to keep in mind that there is this commonality. And, you know, as I pursue my scientific education, that eventually I'll, I'll, I will try and come back 
to this point to try and study if you know I can I can finally even grab some of the things that they were saying. And then physics came in the way, and for about 10 years I did not touch Buddhism for a while, uh, as things go. And then uh, it was around the year when pandemic you know, struck, and I was in the US, I was wrapping up my dissertation, and uh, I had no access to my lab, so I was forced to sit at home, um, and I had a lot of free time on my hands, and then I realized, oh, yeah, I, I put aside a lot of these texts that I wanted to read, so let me start reading some of them. And obviously I found out I could not understand any word <laughs> in the text, and I was trying to read them in, uh, initially I was trying to read them in Tibetan, uh, but I found that my grasp of the language was not good, enough, at least not the Tibetan that's written in the text was good enough to understand them. So I was reading Tibetan texts along with the English translations, which is kind of weird if you think about it, because I come from a Tibetan background, and you would think I'd be able to read it entirely in Tibetan, but it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Um, then I started attending some of the classes by, uh, as you might know, Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula, and, uh, and that was really helpful in getting me started in my pursuit of you know, um, understanding Buddhist philosophy. And, since then, I think it's been about three years that I've been studying under him, almost you know two, three classes weekly online uh, and in Tibetan. And so it has now enabled me to read many of the texts in Tibetan and understand more than I used to. Uh, obviously, not enough, uh, but you know I'll keep trying. Um, but at the same time, my you know the reason for studying Buddhism. I think has kind of changed over the years. Uh, initially, and I think it might be same, similar for many of you, you know, who are here right now. As a young student, I did not really care too much about whether or not samsara had an end. <laughs> my, uh, my curiosity is like, lay more in whether or not I can understand what the atom is doing, as you know, physics explains it, from a Buddhist perspective, whether Buddhism accepts or even you know, entertains some of the ideas in quantum mechanics. So I was mostly philosophically driven at that point. And now that you know, I'm entering, or I've entered my 30s, <laughs> obviously some of the, you know, the usual traits of samsara are becoming apparent, and I care more about you know, <laughs> life outside of physics. And especially, you know, I think pandemic hit many of us really hard, uh, I think. And so, you know, and one of the reasons I turned to Buddhism was as a coping mechanism, I needed something to fall back upon, a support system. And psychologically, Buddhism had always played that part for me because I was uh, raised in this environment, in a Buddhist environment. So whenever I hear teachings, or whenever I even hear His Holiness's voice, it would soothe me, regardless of what he was talking about. He could be talking about something political, <laughs> but it would still soothe me just, to, uh, you know, just being a Tibetan and being raised in this environment. And then, particularly paying attention to some of the things, the, you know, the values that he was espousing in his teachings, uh, it really helped me personally, um, you know, get through the pandemic and obviously other difficult situations in life. So now I think Buddhism has a different, you know, I, I see a different aspect to it, um, other than just the philosophical side, obviously. And maybe I have a slightly more holistic picture of the Buddhist project that, you know, as we say, as Geshe often says, that it is the ignorance that is at the root of this condition that we are suffering, uh, in our suffering condition. And so it is with the knowledge that we begin trying, even trying to get out of it, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think I see it slightly more holistically, although in terms of practice, you know, I still have a lot to do uh, I don't really do much, as much as I probably should be doing, but, um, you know, with some of these newer perspectives in mind, I think, you know, I'm slowly heading there, obviously, and so are all of the people gathered here. I think you see a need for practice, that's why you're here, a need for uh, maybe, you know, getting rid of some of this ignorance that is plaguing us. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's my, <laughs> that's, that's what I wanted to say about my, 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 yeah, relationship with Buddhism yeah, so far. Should I say anything else? Or? <laughs> <laughs>
Anything else that's, you want me to stress? That sounds good. I, okay. I would uh, open. I would say if people have questions. I mean, I can definitely uh, talk about you know quantum mechanics and what I see are the similarities, the similarities. But we could also open up to questions yeah, immediately see, and if, see if it comes up. If people are even interested <laughs> to begin with, I don't want to force physics onto people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you call on people. There's one question. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, hi. Um, as a scientist, uh, I would like to know uh, how does science uh, explain the stars? Yeah, I don't think it can. I mean, um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being completely honest. I don't think there's even a notion of, you know, some Sarah in the sense that there is an escape, you know, and I don't think it nece there is necessarily a notion from the scientific perspective. Obviously, I'm a physicist. I don't really understand, you know, like some of the biological explanation of, you know, how we evolved into this state, whether it's even a good thing <laughs> that we evolved or all of that. But so far, I don't think there's even a notion of, you know, because samsara necessarily entails, I think, a soteriological aspect, you know, like there's a liberation, there's an escape from this state of suffering. But science, I don't think necessarily has that. So um, when you look at it, Buddhism has, you know, shilam devu, how, how do you, she bases Base the path and the fruits, right? Like the results. Uh, science probably only has the basis. You study what's out there. You don't necessarily put values as to whether it's good or bad. You know, anger, for instance, is not, I don't think it's necessarily seen as a bad thing, <laughs> evolutionarily speaking. It probably helps us escape from, da uh, you know, certain dangerous situations, which could, you know, endanger our survival. Um, so I don't think it necessarily has, uh, it's, it's even a perspective within the scientific, you know, worldview. I don't know, I could be wrong. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, there. Um, I think for me, I think energy is maybe easier to see as dependent because energy in some, cell, some sense is intangible, you know, not tangible. So like matter, for instance, has a very definite, if you will, shape, form, and it almost seems like it has an autonomous you know, existence uh, irrespective of its surrounding, uh, more so irrespective of the observer, you know, the subject. Uh, energy has a more fluid existence, I think. It constantly changes, you know, form. It goes from, you know, being radiation to being heat to being some kind of work, you know. So you see that energy is in some sense in a constant state of flux, if you will. Uh, but then also from, if I may add, from, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, we know that energy and mass or matter are equivalent. They're one, two aspects of the same thing, you know. They interchange all the time. So even energy, if you understand matter as being empty and in interdependent, I think you can, you can therefore also bring in energy as being interdependent from that understanding. Because prior to that, people used to think of those two as different entities altogether. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's a really good point. Um, uh, we, I don't think we necessarily even have to go to the Higgs boson within the, uh, you know, the standard framework within which physics explains all <laughs> material things. Uh, there are a set, there, I, I forget the number, but there is a set of fundamental particles. Um, and fundamental particles are particles that you cannot break into smaller you know, constituents. One of them is the electron the you know, good old electron that is you know, <laughs> running all around giving us light, uh, you know, making sure that the milk and the water mix and you know, give us tea, all of that. So um, the thing is, 
And um, I had a discussion about this recently. Um, one way in which, I th in which you know, quantum mechanics challenges our, our perception of the world, I think is when, when we think about things, especially about you know, fundamental constituents of nature, we often start with the very coarse and the gross object, right? like the table, for instance. And then we think, okay, this has a very certain definite shape. In other sense, it has a very definite position. And you know, with respect to me, in respect to me, this is not moving, so I can assign a very definite, uh, you know, motion to this table. Right? I can ascertain simultaneously both the position and the motion of this table. Right? And obviously, then you might think the table is made up of you know smaller parts. If I keep going further and further down, I'll end up at the fundamental building blocks. Right? And because the table has this very wonderful property where it has a definite position and motion simultaneously, the fundamental building blocks should also have that property. But as it turns out from our experimental investigations that an electron does not, okay? So therefore, I think it's very difficult to then say that uh, just by the virtue of the fact that, that the electron is that the electron is a fundamental particle that you cannot break any further, that then um, that that necessarily has to then exist objectively, or you know, uh, cannot be empty. Um, I think it can still be empty in the sense, in this way, um, the electron. If people are familiar with the wave particle duality that you know quantum mechanics is famous for, which I think is in some sense a misunderstanding, but anyhow. The electron obviously cannot be a particle and a wave at the same time. These are two mutually exclusive, uh, uh, yeah, mutually ex exclusive, you know, states of being, if you will. But then the electron does appear to be a particle depending on how you look at it, okay? And the electron can also appear to be a wave depending on how you look at it. And here, when I say how you look at it, I mean the experimental, experimental conditions you create around the electron to see it. So the very nature of electron that you posit upon it is dependent on the conditions you create to see it, right? So in that sense, I think it fundamentally challenges the notion that electron has this inherent or intrinsic particality or wave-like nature. That's my opinion, obviously. Uh, some might say that it has some objective nature that is just not uh, visible to us to begin with. Then you can question whether it's even there in the first place if we can't see it. Um, but that would be my take, yeah. Uh, let's start with this. What are the similarities you found between Buddhism and quantum physics? Yeah, so I think branching off of what I just uh, spoke about right now, I think quantum mechanics allowed for a change in the way which we talk about reality. <coughs> I think for some people, you know, maybe <laughs> they take a pretty strong leap and say, that somehow now the subject is involved, right? Uh, prior to quantum mechanics, there was a belief, there was a strong supposition that you know we could just study the world objectively, objectively in the sense that however the world appears to us or whatever we learn about it is independent of how we try to see it. In other, in other words, it is independent of how we measure it. That there is this objective reality, there's these objective particles that are moving around, creating this gross you know, world that we experience. Uh, quantum mechanics, I think, fundamentally challenged that. At least you know, our observations initially challenged that. And then the theory that came out of it, particularly the theory that was espoused by people like Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg, challenged that notion. Um, and so therefore, some people took it further, such as you know, um, Julian Wigner, who said that um, at the end of it, it is the consciousness of the person seeing it that has to play the decisive role in deciding what the electron is. Some people don't go that far. I probably won't go that far. I think it is really just the uh, experimental environment in which you try to see the electron. So this dependence of the electron's nature, if you can call it that, on how you try to see this nature, or how you try to see the electron, on its environment, on the measurement apparatus, I think is a fundamentally different notion from 
you know, earlier physics. And you could then, I think, push the boundaries a little bit and say, if the electron, however it is, is dependent on how you look at it, then does it even have an objective reality? Like you can obviously ask that question, and I think it's an open-ended question at the moment, but at least it provides an avenue where you can then, you know, try to investigate some of these questions from a, let's say, from a Madhyamika lens. And there are people who do that, to be honest. If you've heard of Carlo Rivoli, like, you know, he's a well-known Italian physicist, and he, he has a very specific interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's called relational quantum mechanics, where from the very foundation, he says that the electron has no autonomous, objectively autonomous description. As soon as you start describing the electron, you also have to describe everything around it that interacts with it. So there's a causal network, or if you can call it, an uh, you know, interdependence network, where by describing the electron, you're describing something else, and you have to describe something else to describe the electron. So there's no escaping this network. Um, so in that sense, you know, there really, I mean, it now appears to us that within this framework, we cannot, really, uh, <laughs> we cannot really think of the electron as something that is, you know, autonomously real anymore, I think. At least there's no description. Whether or not there's an autonomously real objective electron, it's still, I think, open to investigation. Uh, let's go with that. Yeah. Uh, contradictions, you said? Yeah, uh, definitely, yeah. And this is where, you know, I enjoy uh, debating with, the, with my monk friends. Um, <laughs> so this notion of, uh, you know, so without going into the details, there is, in a sense, uh, a notion of probability and randomness that creeps into quantum mechanics that is very different from probability that was, you know, you know, expected and understood in classical physics, physics that came before quantum mechanics. So for instance, you know, I can talk about the temperature of this, the water in this cup. Uh, I can talk about some of the things that are happening in this room, you know, in terms of, you know, how heat is flowing from one place to another. Much of my knowledge as to what is happening with regards to the heat flow in this room will be probabilistic in the sense that I will not have a definite knowledge of it. And that is because I don't have uh, the information that is required to have the definite knowledge from a classical physics perspective, which is for that I have to know the position and the state of every atom in this room, right? And we're talking about many, many atoms, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> so we don't have the capacity. So then we come up with what is called a statistical, statistical description, which is we kind of clump together a lot of similar things and ignore the differences, and that introduces probability, okay? So in earlier physics, probability was a sign of ignorance, that you know, you're ignoring a lot of these things, you're ignorant about the full description of the system. Now in quantum mechanics, even with the full description of the system, there is probability. And this probability is in intrinsic. And in some sense, this introduces certain um, you know, challenges to uh, some of the cherished uh, you know, beliefs in Buddhism such as, I wouldn't call it belief, but you know, some of the postulates. Uh, causality, for instance, that there is a definite relation between cause and effect, that you can posit a relationship between cause and effect in a definite manner. And that becomes prob uh, problematic in quantum mechanics, I think. And I think that that is one way in which, uh, you know, uh, philosophically it's a challenge for, let's say, Buddhist philosophers to make full sense of quantum mechanics as it is presented right now, the standard description of the theory. Yeah. I think you had a question? Oh, oh, that, yeah. oh, yeah. Do you have a question? So, uh, uh, that is quantum mechanics have a uh, different sort of explanation for consciousness, like about very different from what is taught in religious philosophy, or like what we are taught in biological discipline, what we learn to do. So, Yeah, so quantum mechanics has no explanation for consciousness, unfortunately. Uh, quantum mechanics deals with the properties of elementary particles on the belief that 
things that we can study are uh, material things. And, you know, it does not even touch, you know, the mind matter gap, you know, it doesn't even feature in physics. Yeah, Roger Penrose does, but I wouldn't call that quantum mechanics. I think that is not very well established science at the moment, uh, mostly his own opinion, which are well founded, I think, you know, to some degree. But I don't think it's a scientific opinion just yet. I think you had a question for somebody else. Dimensions, okay. Dimensions. Uh -huh. In your lab, okay, maybe one of the dimensions is lack, but uh -huh. maybe in the Buddhism, the samsara and everything cause and effect is a past, future, present, like it's it will be. I, I'm all the time in my experience, and I'm not a researcher, I'm only a curious woman, and I feel that it's, it's simultaneously now, the samsara and everything is now. So because of this, maybe we are to have a pure nature. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> yeah. I mean, My question mm, is, yeah, okay. If we eliminate all the dimension or, or, or we look in a different paradigm, maybe the Buddhism, we can look at the Buddhism in a, in a different dimension that we don't have now as available. Oh, look at Buddhism or quantum mechanics in a different If we want to, mm. uh, to find a place to meet from Buddhism and quantum physics, quantum physics in few years, mm. Some, some From the point of the science, I want to know if you take it as a, as a possibility. So can I maybe try to re yeah. state it a little? Just, it, it sounds and like it's the main... It's my first language. Right. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, meaning packed hmm. into the question, but it sounds like starting off from the basic idea of superposition. Yes. And right, that, you know, the cat being both alive and dead simultaneously, mm -hmm. that at one instant, for instance, right now, there's multiple possible realities occurring simultaneously, and Buddhism maybe presents concepts related to one reality that we could access if we wanted to, but physics uh, maybe doesn't quite describe <coughs> the same reality you're saying. Yes, but at the same time, we can be enlightened, and right. not enlightened because we are not in the same... Because it's a superposition. Yes. Right? Ah, okay. So, yeah. So it's superposition, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me start off by saying we do not experiment on cats. So, that <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, that's a very, yeah, so I think I could, let me give you a bit of a preface. So the, the Schrodinger's cat experiment, actually Schrodinger, uh, he was uh, one of the founders of the theory. Uh, he played a huge role in its development, but he was very quickly disillusioned by the direction in which this, you know, science was going where Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and the Copenhagen School was taking this theory into this very mystical realm of you know, things being either this or that at the same time as we heard just now. So as a challenge, he posed this question, this thought experiment. He said, let's put a cat in a box. There's a radioactive pellet. If it decays, and by the laws of quantum mechanics, it decays in a way that is quantum mechanical and we cannot be, and it's random, uh, it would then release a toxin that would then kill the cat, obviously. If it doesn't release a toxin, the, ca the cat is okay. If the radioactive pellet is, you know, fundamentally quantum mechanical and, before, and is therefore dependent on measurement or observation, then so is the cat, 
right, the state of the cat. Then before we open the box, and just as that palette ha is in this superposition state, and I'll explain what that means, I'll try, of, being, of, of having decayed and having not decayed, so then the cat should also be in this superposition state of being dead and alive, okay? So what does superposition mean? So superposition, actually here, this is where I found a striking resemblance between Mulu Matimika Karika, Nagarjuna's root text, and quantum mechanics. So here, so I'll, I'll present it to you, and I think it's maybe superficial, but the language is similar. The radioactive pellet, before observation, has not decayed, and has not not decayed, okay? And has not both decayed and not decayed, and has also not done neither of the two, okay? So if that, <laughs> if that makes sense, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, and so then you ask, so then in what state is the pellet, right? Because we always observe the pellet as either having decayed or not decayed, but that is post-observation, okay? Quantum mechanically, that's different. Prior to observation, it's in this very weird state that we don't have the language for. This is called a superposition because that's the language that came from the mathematics, okay? Uh, mathematically, it makes sense, but you know, in terms of actually understanding it, we have no clue whatsoever. It is the negation of all these real possibilities that we can think of, the possibly real things that we could actually have done based on our common experience that there's a state there that we just don't know. It's almost ineffable, <laughs> right? Uh, so therefore, the cat should also be in this state. Uh, obviously, that was Schrodinger's point, and, you know, um, and it seems ridiculous to say that the cat is in that state because you could very well put a person in that box, right? And then you know, ask, that person has you know, then seen the cat dead or alive. When you open the box, you see that the person has seen that the cat has died or you see that the person has seen that the cat is alive. But what happens before you open the box? The person is in this superposition where you know, his knowledge of the cat's state, you know, well-being, <laughs> is in this really weird state that we just don't have the words for. So therefore, people said, starting from Schrodinger, that really we, we, are, you know, we have to be careful here where we're taking the signs. And, but obviously nowadays people don't, are not very careful. If you go to a physics classroom, uh, we will very well ex you know, uh, accept that the electron is in a superposition. We have no problem whatsoever because the mathematics work out. We find that the observation agrees with our theory. And we don't care too much about making sense of this you know, unobserved state. Okay, fine. So that is you know, superposition cat in a box, all of that, and you know, the philosophical difficulties. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I lost the, track. Wait, uh, yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, OK, 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 yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, so, mm. so I think you know, this mere mention of this philosophical, you know, this paradoxical nature uh, of the underlying philosophy should alert us to not take quantum mechanics that seriously just yet. Uh, because when we talk about, well, here's the problem, okay? Um, my, microscopically, I see that superposition explains my observations really well. Macroscopically, there is no superposition. There is never a table here and there at the same time. Like, you know, well, superposition doesn't say that, but you know, everything works in a way that there is no superposition. I don't need to bring in superposition. So the key question in some sense is, if, let's say, all of quantum mechanics is right, and our, the microscopic foundation of this world works in this really bizarre fashion, why is this macroscopic world so ordinary? Where does this ordinariness come from, given this really extraordinary background? And this is, I think, a... Uh, a fundamental question that people are still investigating. People really don't know where this classical world emerges out of this. How does a classical world emerge out of this quantum, um, you know, background? So I really would not say anything about you know <laughs> what you're positing, whether they can say anything at all. Um, yeah, obviously we're not in the state of being enlightened and you know in the samsara at the same time. At least I don't think I am. <laughs> um, yeah. 
So I think in short, I'm saying, uh, yeah, I don't think we can take quantum mechanics that seriously just yet. Some of these ideas are fascinating, and maybe they're pointing to something deeper that you know still has a lot of, um, you know, unanswered, you know, philosophical problems. Um, but we haven't quite gotten there yet, I think, at least in my very limited knowledge. I think you, yes. Oh, three, okay. <laughs> okay. I will try. <laughs> Yes. Which effect, sir? Ah, oh, okay, cause and effect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the easier one, I think. <laughs> and then I'll have an excuse if I forget the difficult one. So, yeah, so how do things emerge? Like, how do things form? Uh, yeah, chemistry has a very good explanation that, you know, um, things want to be in a state of stability, let's call it that. And that is determined by their, the way in which the electron is arranged around them. And let's, without going into the details, that's what enables two hydrogen atoms to come together with an oxygen to form a water molecule because the three together is more stable than being apart in some sense. And that is pretty much what makes up most of the world that we see. We don't even have to worry about the nucleus. Everything around us is basically driven by the dynamics of this very you know, ordinary looking particle called electron. <laughs> so that is chemistry for you. That explains much of what we see. Uh, then your second question was about cause and effect, right? So, oh yeah, about karma. Yeah, I mean, obviously, karma, I think, even within the Buddhist framework, is difficult to fully comprehend. Of course, there's a cause and effect relationship between having a certain, you know, good intention and having a good effect. But I think, uh, you know, at least my limited understanding is that the way in which causality, at least in the karmic sense, works is very obscure. Uh, Shinto Kokyu, I think. Uh, there are certain, you know, the Buddha has explained in the ways in which karmic causality works, but it's very hard to actually, I think, um, not so much make sense, but to see it for yourself. At least that's my understanding. So I don't want to go to karma because, so why I don't want to touch karma is because it immediately brings in consciousness, right? Uh, when you talk about karmic causation, we're not talking about how a tree or an apple is falling down from a tree. We're talking about how sentient beings, you know, 
transmigrate, re, re, uh, reincarnate, and go to the next life, and what kind of conditions they see in the next life, and the imprints that are left on their consciousness from this life. And so we have to deal with a lot of subtle mechanisms that I'm personally not familiar with. So I don't want to touch that. But I think we can still talk about causality uh, on the physical level, on the mere physical level, right? And yeah, that's true that there is a fundamental, I think, a contradiction between some of the things that, obviously, let's say, you know, even though it is probabilistic, there is a substantial continuum between the electron before and after observation. That is not what we're disputing. What we are disputing is that, is there any sense in which you can uh, predict the future in a way you can by throwing a rock right now? You can predict its trajectory, its motion, right? And you do that on the basis that there is an inherent causal relation between my act of throwing, the force that I apply and all of that, and how it intera how interact with the stone, right? That decides its future state of motion. Quantum mechanically, it's hard to do that. Right? We're not disputing the causal continuum in the sense that there's a substantial continuum, but it is difficult or almost Im impossible to predict the future because it is random. Mm, could I just yes. So, so this, is, this is something that uh, maybe isn't 100% across all Buddhism, but in the logic tradition of the text we mentioned before, the Pramana Vartika Karika, this uh, text that focuses on logic and establishes relations, and especially when we're talking about reasoning, debate and reasoning, right? You have to establish a relation between what? The reason and the predicate. So actually in the, the Buddhist theory that, the one that I'm familiar with to date, which as I've said before, I haven't studied everything, but there, there's actually, there is no way to prove a future event, or in other words, to have a uh, definite knowledge of a future event based on a present event. So you cannot infer the future from the past. In other words, you cannot infer a result from its cause. Only you can infer a cause from its result. Okay, so that, that would be, um, you know, I see. Mm. So, so, the, um, so I don't think that particular point wouldn't be different, at least in the way you just, mm. you just said but, it. Obviously, once you see the smoke, you can then, in a way, infer where it came from. Like, you can, yeah. you see the smoke, you know it comes from some fire, right? Like right. So because you, you say there's a causal relationship between smoke and the fire it originated from. See, even that becomes troublesome in quantum okay, mechanics. Okay, so just yeah. the fact of a causal yeah, relationship it, at all. It, okay. that you can even infer the prior state uh, because of this very... Yeah, random evolution at the moment of observation. And actually, just to bring it up, it is, you know, obviously science is a quote-unquote progressing field, and it's evolving, obviously, and we don't know what our understanding of the microscopic world will be 100 years from now, uh, 100 years before, or 200 years before. People had a very different picture of how things worked, right? And now we have a very different picture. We might have a very different picture two, two year, 200 years from now. So there is definitely room for evolution. Um, but I do want to bring up you know, this very um, seemingly mysterious thing that happens at the moment of observation in, in, in particle you know, quantum physics. It is actually a field of very rigorous research right now, philosophical as well as pure science research, because um, there are so many philosophical contra you know, contradictions tied with this notion of measurement. What does it even mean to measure something, to observe something? We don't necessarily need a, a conscious observer. We can just have a detector there, which can you know, just detect the particle. We don't need to be there. So that is doing the measurement. But what about a tiny air molecule ne next to the electron that is interacting with the electron? Is it observing the electron? Is it making any difference whatsoever? So because of this, there is what is called the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, uh, which is, you know, if you're interested, please feel free to look into it. It's a subject of very rigorous uh, research, philosophical research. Many people invest, invested in knowing or actually uh, you know, exercising <laughs> quantum mechanics of this very troublesome notion that was introduced many years ago by people like Bohr and Heisenberg and others. Um, so yeah, 
Uh, for me, personally, it's very difficult to make sense of it. I know how the math works, and I can you know, predict my observations. But do I really understand what's going on at the moment of measurement? I don't. <laughs> I have no clue what's happening there. Well, as, a, as, you know, as somebody who does quantitative studies, my first question would be, how do you quantify karma? What is, as in, you're putting a value on good karma, there could be levels of good karma, right? Like some are better, some are worse. So, yeah, I think that would be, but obviously, you know, there, I think definitely these observations have been made. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to bring it up at a level of, you know, of scientific fact, let's say. Uh, at the back, then I'll get to you, sorry. Uh, do you believe uh, the constants in physics, like the speed of light or uh, uh, the absolute zero, they uh, are dependent on the existence or they are independent of it? Do I believe? Yeah, I, well, I am a practitioner of special relativity, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the constancy of speed of light brought up by Einstein and his special theory of relativity, yeah, Every known physicist, I think, takes that as a fundamental postulate of nature. You know, that's, that's how it is. So, yeah, do I believe? I believe, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, does it have an independent existence which goes against the philosophy of Buddhism? Yeah, so, I mean, it has a constant speed, but it doesn't necessarily have an independent existence or an autonomous existence. Let me give you an example. The very famous double slit experiment that was done, you know, you see that light depending on, again, just like the electron, not very different, has a nature that is particle-like or wave-like, depending on how you observe it, okay? If you open both the slits, what you get at the back, you cannot explain if whatever was coming from your source were individual particles, okay? You would have to explain it assuming that light is wave-like. And um, if you close one of the slits, then what you see at the back is what you would expect if just a stream of particles were coming through, right? So in that sense, it is not independent. It is very much dependent, just like the electron, right? I think you had a question. Well, I mean, I think it's clear that if you accept that there's an immaterial mind consciousness, it is clear from the Buddhist text, and you know, I believe in those, uh, that mind and matter interact. You know, they affect each other uh, in a cooperative condition way, right? Uh, from a, a physicist standpoint, I would say I do not believe that. I don't think, uh, um, if I were to investigate, you know, the world from, you know, from a physicist perspective, I would not even take mind as a factor into it at the moment because we don't have any theoretical mechanism to even incorporate such an interaction between mind and matter. And as I pointed out just now, physics, like a lot of science, to maintain its rigor has to be very quantitative, right? It has to really quantify what it's studying and we just don't have any 
you know, way in which we can incorporate whatever the consciousness might be, right? So, but from a, you know, as a, as a Buddhist, obviously, I think mind and matter interact, uh, you know, especially with regards to the karmic theory. It's very, uh, you know, we know that there is connection there. But even from a philosophical perspective, because I don't know if people are exposed to the mind-only school. We didn't talk about it so much. Okay, so there is a particular school called the mind-only school. Uh, you know, proponents such as Arya Sangha and Vasubandhu, who taught that everything is of the nature of the mind. There is no external external reality. That you know, <laughs> it's the same substance, so to speak. In that sense, very much so, you're creating your own reality in a way, right? So there it is really pronounced uh, how mind affects matter, if you posit. Of course, there's no external matter, but a matter that ex appears external to you, to your mind that is defiled you know, by ignorance, according to this school. Uh, so yeah, you can definitely talk about that, I think, in the Buddhist philosophical tradition. Yeah, again. Very tricky for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So, right. Obviously, I mean, if there is a big object sailing on the sea, regardless of whether I could name it or not, I would think that this would be my assumption. I would see something. I might not see a ship in the sense. I might not think of it as you know people in there driving it one way or the other. Uh, but I think they would see something coming towards you. Uh, but sort of related to that, you know, when you might look at a picture, right, um, with a collection of shapes, you might group different shapes together depending on your, you know, preconditioning. You might see like a house. Some people might see just like a wheel because that's what you're preconditioned to seeing in, to some extent. So you might see very different things. But obviously, everything does appear to you. You, you. You are just conceptually grouping them differently, so to speak. So that might be happening. I, I don't know. I'm guessing. Do you have any idea about this? Yeah, that's a, that's a good explanation. I mean, now we're in psychology and not physics so much, right? I just I'll share a personal experience. So the Tibetan word for the moon, or I should say, a Tibetan name, you know, uh, for the moon, an eponym, is the rabbit possessor, the thing with a rabbit. Okay, the idea being, when you look at the moon, there's a picture of a rabbit in it. <laughs> so for years, I was living in Tibetan communities and knew this term, and looked at the moon and couldn't see a rabbit. And one day, I looked at the moon and I just saw the rabbit. <laughs> Did I miss anybody from here? I'm sorry, I'm yes. not very good at this. Between two electrons? Yeah, like the, the entanglement? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this is where quantum gets really weird. Uh, <laughs> so, in quantum mechanics, you can prepare two particles in a state where their existence, in a way, is so fundamentally intertwined. We call it entanglement. And what that means is. You could then separate these two particles out as far apart as the two ends of a galaxy, okay? So there's no way I can uh, relay any information about the state of one particle after having measured it to somebody else who's at the other end of the galaxy because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, as that person mentioned. So, but then, quantum mechanically, as soon as you measure the state of one particle, you simultaneously determine the state of the other particle. It's not like they were already in those two states and then you found out 
by just logical exclusion that the other has to be in the other state. No, they're in a superposition state. Again, they're in a superposition, two particle superposition state, which means we can rule out all the logical possibilities. And, in it, and those two particles are in this weird state that we kind of discussed. But then when you measure one, immediately you know what the other is doing. This does not happen in classical physics. Um, because in classical physics, a lot of our theories are what we call, or, or contain what we call local realism, which means the, the full description of a particle or an object is contained within the local causal boundary around it that can interact with it, okay? Anything outside is not going to impact what, that, what the state of this thing is. But here we have two particles seemingly separated, at least physically, but not in terms of their state, which is so deeply entangled that we cannot really think of these two as two separate autonomous entities, so to speak, right? Again, in this sense, I think I'm glad you, you know, brought it up because here we have, in a way, an interdependence of two things, even though they're so far apart, that is very unique uh, to the quantum mechanical description and it doesn't take a lot of you know, thinking to then kind of connect and see parallels between this idea and some of the ideas in you know, the Buddhist theory of emptiness and inter interdependence, for instance. Obviously, I don't want to make that uh, connection very strictly because I think it still needs to be investigated. But yeah, there's definitely avenues where you can have conversations along those lines. You and then you. The simplest way, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll repeat the question. What, what is the simplest way of understanding Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? So let me explain what that means, the uncertainty principle. It, uh, I think we touched upon it earlier. It basically says there are these sets of properties that we can assign to, let's say, an electron that we cannot ascertain simultaneously. For instance, the electron's position and its motion. Um, and there are other things that we cannot ascertain with full certainty simultaneously. There, I don't know if there's a simple way of understanding it, because here's the tricky part. Quantum mechanics, if somebody had laid out the theory without any of the experiment, experimental findings, nobody would take it seriously, obviously. They would think, you know, you're crazy or something. You're describing a world we just do not see, right? Quantum mechanics is one of those uh, you know, scientific disciplines that really came out of empirical studies. It came out of our failure to explain how the atomic world was functioning based on our very, you know, coherent, objectively real Newtonian and classical physics and Einsteinian physics. That failure led us, you know, to this theory now we call quantum mechanics, which on the one hand is the most successful theory we have. Every prediction, almost 99% has, you know, agrees with our observations, okay? On the other hand, it is also the least understood of the theories, really. And that is, I think, a profound challenge. I don't know how to explain uncertainty principle. What do the, what do the, um, what do the studies suggest about it? What, what, like what, um, how did it arise? Is it oh, so the question is, how does this uncertainty arise? Well, it I know how it arises from the mathematical, you know, foundations. I don't know how it arises physically. <laughs> I don't know if any... <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, experiments are observations, right? So it doesn't really explain why it is the way it is. It just gives us certain facts that we have to then connect and explain. And we... And traditionally, we use mathematics, and mathematics was kind of grounded on, at least the mathematics used in physics, was kind of grounded on our physical intuitions, right? So it was okay. We could assign properties such as position, speed, you know, shapes and mass and all that. And we say, okay, there are certain, you know, qualitative analogs I can experience that, you know, um, you know that, that, I, that I can ascribe to speed and all of that. That's fine. But quantum mechanics brings in some of these mathematical, you know, ideas we just don't have a physical intuition for, such as, Superposition, you know, what I was describing earlier. But 
we haven't found a way so far to do away with superposition and still explain what we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, you, and then I'll get to you. Sorry. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, yeah, I think that's a much easier question. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, I don't want to, you know, uh, spread this false idea that all, you know, Tibetans are nice and kind. It's not necessarily true. But deeply rooted in the culture is a, you know, people tend to value life, any form of life. So I remember during the monsoon days going for, you know, going around the temple. Uh, you know, and there would be so many of these earthworms that would come onto the streets, and me and my brother, it would take us like an hour just moving them to the side of the road. Just because nobody told us to do that, that's what we saw around us, and that was just so inbuilt. So there are those kind of values that, you know, you generally find, at least we used to find, I don't know if it's still there, uh, but, you know, I grew up, you know, exposed to those type of values so you know necessarily when I you know then when I got to the west and you know there's not everywhere but in some places you know there's a disregard for life forms that are not necessarily close to humans like insects and bugs like the first way of dealing with like a spider was to just squash it and that never occurs to a Tibetan the first thing we try to do even though many of us are scared of spiders, we don't want to touch it. We try to capture it in a jar or something and release it somewhere far away, you know, hopefully. Um, but those sort of, you know, small details like really struck out. And I think it's just the cultural upbringing that made a difference there. Yeah, I really don't have a lot, a lot of other experiences here with regards to that. I think you had a question. Yeah. So there are like two parts. Uh, one is, see, we had a classical understanding of physics, uh -huh. yeah. wherein we said we made transistors with electrons 0 and 1. Slowly, slowly, we went deeper into physics, and we had uh, statistical quantum mechanics and foundational quantum mechanics. Now we have uh, supercomputers and also quantum computer, uh, computers, which basically work on you know quarks being you know in the uh, present state of 0 and 1 both, right, in context of measurement. Now the whole idea is that probably something more will develop further from this and also of course the fact that we can do calculations at uh, 10 to the power 32 times much more faster now, right? The Buddhist philosophy there that there is eight stages of death, there is consciousness, mm -hmm. etc. Right? And then your consciousness leaves your heart chakra in the end and then you are in bardo. Probably, I don't know, but probably these are also quirks which exist in space. Wait, so what are quirks, sorry? Which quirks? ones? The fundamental particles. Uh -huh. So like the eight uh -huh. fundamental particles in quantum mechanics. Yes. So Actually more than that, but yes. Yeah, so these also would essentially, consciousness would also be a sort of a, uh, you know, being. So therefore, Quirks, they need to be observed. It is a dependent arising. If it is not observed in its state, it exists in both states and you can't do your calculations. Consciousness, <coughs> again, everything being a dependent arising, <coughs> that unless observed, nothing inherently exists. <coughs> do you think further going into this whole theory as we develop further, maybe 100 years, 200 years, 1000 years, it actually might be this quirk inside a computer, a quantum computer, laughing at us and saying, hey, today you don't even realize that, you know, it, it was me, your father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the basic question is... So the basic question is, yeah, uh, you know... Is are fundamental are, particles yeah. beings? Yes. Or in other words, do they have, <laughs> do they have consciousness, is what yes. you're asking? 
Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, so, I mean, I think we have to be careful here because, again, going back to, you know, of course we can ask these type of questions, but we have to base these questions on some <laughs> form of empirical reality, like from where we are bridging out, right? So we haven't even reached consciousness, and now we are ascribing consciousness to fundamental particles. That's the leap I'm not ready to make yet. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously, you know, we can talk about that, but, yeah, I think we can talk about it, but I think outside of the framework of science at the moment, that just wouldn't fit there. And if I started telling you something, it would, yeah, I would be just lying to you, really. Like, yeah, consciousness is a difficult thing to explain scientifically. Forget about whether, you know, all the particles have a consciousness or not. Even the fact that there's no doubt we have some form of mental, you know, property, that there's something going on qualitatively that seems to be different from how this cup might strike, you know, this bowl, for instance. We have that, that subjective experience. But so far, you know, it really, it has eluded a precise definition or a formulation within the scientific discipline. I mean, I might be wrong. This is, you know, well outside of my, my realm of expertise. Neuroscience might have something sensible to say about this, but I just haven't heard anything so far. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. I think back there, yes. When you get into conflict with your wife or kids, yeah. how does your understanding of Buddhism help you guys navigate this conflict? I think, you know, and Geshe-la once mentioned to me, and not just personally to me, but to the class, that you know that you have, you're taking, you know, the Dharma study seriously when at any moment you engage in something that is not wholesome immediately after you start, you know, thinking about it, reflecting upon it, and thinking, okay, I did something that was not proper, and you start thinking about, okay, how do I make sure I don't do it again? But obviously you do it again, <laughs> out of habituation. So I think what, you know, my not so long, you know, some few years of exposure to, you know, some form of practice has done is help me reflect on those, you know, at the, in the aftermath of those moments. Of course, I get angry at my kids. I'm annoyed by them. I get annoyed and irritated, you know, at my wife. <laughs> she gets annoyed at me. This happens, right, obviously. And I think dharma practice is a very slow and gradual process. And you really have to take, like, one step at a time. And for me, noticing that, you know, not all the time, but every now so often I see myself reflecting and thinking, oh, I should be, you know, more mindful about how I react to certain situations, I think is, you know, I think comes from my exposure to them. But, yeah, at this point, I don't really have anything more to say because I, yeah, I obviously react just the way I used to do before I started studying the text, you know. And I think it would be very unreasonable of me to expect, expect any significant change at this point. Like, His Holiness often talks about how his meditations on compassion and emptiness has impacted his worldview. But then he also says, this is after many decades of practice, of very serious practice, that is, and I'm nowhere close to that, and I'm talking only a few years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, almost next to no difference at this point. Um, I just wonder if you yeah. could just mention Kishu Toshi Damdu's like, classes he teaches, so in case anyone's interested. Oh, yeah, I never sure. mentioned him before. So uh, Geshe Doji Damdu teaches, um, you know, English language courses for people who are more comfortable with English. Uh, but his philosophy, he teaches what I think it's called the Nalanda Diploma course. Uh, it's a very brief, but I think a complete introduction to the foundations. And then there's the five-year course that he that is underway right now, where they really study the text systematically. And then I think every now and then he hosts these retreats. I think there was one at Tushita not so long ago. Bodhicitta yeah, retreat. Two weeks in Root Institute. In Root Institute. Oh, yeah, there's, that's in Bodh Gaya, right? Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, he's very busy. He travels all the time. And, um, yeah, I find him very effective as a teacher. And, and you would, you're interested? Oh, uh, Geshe Dorji Tamdil. Dorji. We'll send out, uh, okay. like, a list of some resources and include that. The okay. flyers from 
that house is on the other side in the flyer holder. Oh. Yeah, he's one of the rare, I think, Tibetan teachers who's also very fluent in English, which is, you know, kind of rare for many of the people uh, of his generation. Uh, often have to rely on a translator, but he doesn't. So many people find him very effective that way. And he's a good teacher to begin with. I think, I think more questions? Or? Let's go with this. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions, but I'll ask one first. Thank you. I'll ask the non, non physics question first. Um, so, I have, so I used to be a very rational and logical person until like a couple of years back. Very much into Western science and stuff. And then you started Buddhism? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, some things. Oh, yeah. So I think the gist of the question is, you know, this conflict between things that are, you know, such as Ayurveda and, you know, other more spiritual practices that obviously have a benefit. They help people, and there's a definite benefit to practicing these things, but they don't necessarily have a very uh, solid scientific foundation. You know, science doesn't really explain or even entertain some of these ideas, right? And so uh, I think the question is, uh, why do you even engage with science in the first place if, you know, there's no scientific explanation and how do you reconcile this yeah, right, how conflict? Can we sort of go back to these or how can we have a reintroduction of these because people are becoming so scientific. And but these things okay. are clearly valuable and I really see. important. So how do we uh, reintroduce some of these, you know, more uh, traditional, could be medicinal or spiritual practices into our societies where the society has already become seemingly very rational or scientific, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think science, so, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll be saying some things that are maybe not correct here and very subjective. Uh, I think science has to first of all accept that it does not explain everything, right? I think scientists as people have to be objectively humble here uh, because it is so ingrained in the minds of some people who, practice, who do science, such as me when I was a little younger, that almost everything will eventually be explained by science through its what is called a scientific method of inquiry. And I don't know if I really believe that anymore. I think there are certain aspects of our world that you know maybe lie beyond the boundary of scientific knowledge. Where does that boundary lie? I don't know. Uh, but definitely there are things that are very helpful to people. You know, I mean, obviously science doesn't explain ethics, for instance, but ethics is so crucial to our survival. And you know, I think you know, there's so many other things, as you pointed out. I don't think necessarily that there has to be a re, uh, you know, you have to reconcile the two in the sense you have to explain one from the other framework. I think you can keep it separate and still function and acknowledge the fact that there is a boundary where your knowledge, you know, or your application of a certain knowledge fails. I think at least that's what I, I try to do. I don't know what others might do. Okay. Oh, yeah, you. Yeah, so coming back again to the same point, I mean, again, 
I don't think quantum mechanics even touches the question of enlightenment because there is no aspect of liberation that, you know, there's no value judgment as to how the world is. Like, talk about suffering, but that is still explained by how things move around. It appears as suffering to you because you're losing some of your particles when I hit you. <laughs> uh, but other than that, you know, whether <laughs> there is, there's really no sense in which any value judgment is applied there. And then when we talk about enlightenment, we bring in ideas about consciousness, which again, as I said, it's very difficult. Again, you know, here uh, it's very tempting, I think, to kind of take some of these weird implications from quantum mechanics and then to try and apply it to certain, you know, mystical things that we don't understand and kind of put them on the same, you know, pedestal and say they're equal or there's overlap. Uh, but we have to be careful. We have to be very careful and uh, try to be as objective as we can be uh, through our subjective lens and and not conflate the two. Uh, because it happens all the time, for instance, people you know, who engage in what is called pseudoscience, where they over-extrapolate ideas and concepts from uh, quantum mechanics and say things like, the entire universe is in a superposition state where everything is entangled. I don't know what that means. And I'm not sure they do either, but it sounds deep. And, and we have to be careful there, I think. Uh, I'm being very honest here. We have to ground ourselves on things that we can validate from multiple perspective, perspectives before we move to the next stage, I think. I think, he, yeah, you had a question. Yeah. Ah, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, I think um, a couple of texts. I think there's the 37 Practices of the Bodhisattva by Kese uh, Tome Sangpo. He was a Tibetan master, uh, Sakya master. Uh, it really is what is called Lojong mind training, is it? a text on mind training and stresses the importance of uh, you know, cultivating compassion. Uh, because oftentimes I think, uh, at least for me, it is when I can um, identify with others suffering that my own suffering lessens a little bit. You know, I gain a different perspective. It's when I focus too much on myself and what I'm going through uh, that you know, it affects me more. Um, so that text I would recommend, it's easy to read and I think there are many different, definitely a good English translation to that text. If you want to delve a little further, I think uh, Bodhicharya Avatara by uh, Arya Shantidev, I think that's a really good text as well. Especially the fourth chapter on forbearance, is it? Suba? Suba's so chapter six. Yeah. Chapter six. We went through a little bit. Uh, is it um, translated as forbearance or? Uh, patience or forbearance. Patience or forbearance. Uh, I mean, I find that um, I find that chapter full of so many practical advices about you know as to how to deal with difficult situations that you face in life. Yeah, I would recommend those. And obviously, you know, I, I don't know all the texts. I'm not that familiar. You should ask Gela and others for good recommendations. Yeah. And I think you had a question. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, the, the the science made the. how you can explain the reality, like, you know, if you are a spider, you see everything different. How you, you can explain the, like, emptiness of this reality, right? of this? Um, how yeah. to explain uh -huh. the real thing, but because the, the thing is real for you, but for other species or mm. species, sure. Ah, okay. Uh, are you asking whether or not I can uh, assert that there really is something based on my observation that yeah, yeah, is very... Yeah, I try to say, oh, this, is, this is real, no? Ah, okay, okay, yeah. But it's real for, you know, independence of some, some like, mm -hmm. like it's totally impossible to find science, true science, because it depends on, you know, your speeds, your... Uh, yeah, but I mean... Um, so here, you know, when, when I'm observing an electron, for instance, what it's doing, I'm using sensors 
And underlying this experiment is a belief that there is an electron and there is an interaction between an electron and the sensor, right? There is something happening there. And because of something happening, I can infer that something happened. But that's a fundamental belief. Obviously, you could say all of the interaction is based on, you know, the fact that I'm using sensors. And if you were using, well, I think this, again, strikes back to the whole wave particle stuff, that reality is, in fact, <coughs> dependent on how you observe it, right? So I don't think there's necessarily a conflict. But science also, okay, so that is more the epistemological side of it, like how you know things um, are there. But then there's also, to some extent, an ontological side to things, like are there really things out there that you're observing, that you are observing and then you're seeing through your lens or whatever you might call it? It, that is very hard for science to abandon, <laughs> you know, because every theory starts off by positing something that is objectively there. And then you build up the theory and then you say, but that objectively real thing or whatever is out there interacts with certain other things, but that interaction might then bring up things or appearances that are then dependent or subjective. You know, so I think there are two levels, like epistemologically, there's some things that might be subjective, but then ontologically, you say there's something there, whether or not you actually see it or not. Yeah, but you put the intention before the experiment, so then the human Yeah, 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 no, that's, like that. That, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, no, that, that's a, yeah, I think you can definitely ask that, that question, yeah. But science, I feel, functions in this manner. Yeah, but that's a fair question to ask, I sure. It also relates to the fundamental problem of measurement. How so? <laughs> <laughs> Perspective. Uh -huh. If a spider is measuring versus a human being is measuring, yeah. seeing, right? So measuring is also observing, and observing could be anything. Yeah, but I mean, we could obvi obviously, you know, we are sensitive to different, you know, if I may use technical terms, different wavelengths in the spectrum of light. Spiders or insects might be sensitive to certain, you know, wavelengths we're not sensitive. But that we can explain from science. It's not like we cannot explain. We can look at the uh, look at the signals that the retina from the fly or something that's you know sending out to the brain or the nervous system when we expose that particular set of cells to a particular wavelength of light. So we can make that subjective sense even from science. But I think his question is going a little bit deeper. I think right that your very intention is kind of shaping what you might see, which, you know, of course, I, I, I'm not able to make it very precise, but I think it goes towards something. Like experiment without, like pushing intention. So then, then you cannot uh, see what's real, you cannot be the answer of intention to see what's going on. Wait, what do you mean you cannot make an experiment without an intention? Like, I obviously, uh-huh. Yeah, but then even when you investigate whether something is empty of you know inherent existence, you have the intention of analyzing that it's objective existence, right? So that intention is still there. I don't know how that's very different. Like, without intention, I don't think we would even bother about it. Like, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I suppose at this moment it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, so I think his question is if, in fact, the mind that is so powerful in the Buddhist understanding carries the karmic imprints from one life to another, helps shape the external environment that you're born in, right? Then, you know, within a scientific understanding, does it pass? Then you should be able to observe in effect, this mechanism, this interaction, I guess. So does it pass the Occam's razor, you know, that you could actually explain things from, by incorporating mind into your understanding? I, yeah, I just don't think it does. I think it's really, really, yeah, you, I think there needs to be, to use the, uh, you know, 
the famous expression, a paradigm shift in how you even look at reality. Like you have to first even entertain the, the possibility that there's something beyond the material. Of course, there are people who, you know, say they do studies on, there are people actually who are studying, you know, the post-death state, Tukdam, in, you know, in southern India, in the monasteries. I don't know how much they've discovered or, you know, uncovered as to this mechanism between mind and matter. Uh, there are also people who are supposedly studying reincarnation through like case studies, like, you know, looking at people who remember their previous life. But yeah, it's still, I think, at the very, you know, at the outskirts of what is the scientific, you know, investigate, field of scientific in investigation, yeah. Okay, a lot of, many. yeah, okay, let's go. So, yeah. Uh, do you think that the idea that uh, reality is Me neither. <laughs> yeah, I'll start with that one because I think, yeah, I'll give you a quick answer because I don't know much about it. Uh, so string theory is an attempt at um, reconciling uh, two very important aspects of our physical theories. One is gravity. Uh, everything massive and big, the galaxies, the cosmic, you know, entities are governed by Einstein's theory of relativity, general relativity, which is a theory of gravity, okay? But all of that is based upon pre-quantum notions of how things are, you know? So there's an objective, objectively real thing doing its, you know, it's functioning out there. And then you have quantum mechanics, which describes the most, you know, the smallest of particles, uh, you know, the least massive particles and how they function. And again, it's really successful in doing that. Somehow we have to bring them together and explain things like a black hole or the very origin of our universe, if you believe in Big Bang being the absolute origin, right? As many of the scientists do. Then you really have to explain those two things together. And they don't like to be together. String theory is one attempt at explaining quantum gravity, uh, theory of quantum gravity, where the two things come together. But then, Mathematically, it's really elegant. Like there's so many beautiful ideas that emerge out of this theory, such as all the different fundamental particles are actually different modes of vibration of a fundamental string. It's just a string that vibrates in a different way. You, it becomes an electron, it becomes a quark. So it really ties everything together in a neat way. But then, you know, that is not what science is. You can have beautiful theories, but you also have to make, uh, you know, predictive, you know, you have to make predictions, basically. And so far, it hasn't really predicted anything groundbreaking that we have seen anywhere. Well, it could be the limitation of our tools. Nobody knows, but then really we have invested a lot of money, uh, multi-billion dollars into colliders that hasn't really shown any sign that there is physics beyond what we currently have, such as string and other things. That is not to say we might not see it, but right now I think a lot of people are on the fence about how seriously to take string theory. Again, it has a lot of applications. It has applications to fields where people did not think string theory had anything to say about them, such as, uh, let, okay, let not, let's not go into that. Uh, what was your, is that, you had two questions. Oh yeah, the first one was, Simulation. Yeah, in a sense, I think Buddhism <laughs> kind of explains that this objective reality is a simulation of your mind that is imputing objectivity onto things that are really not inherently there. That is not to say it is, you know, an illusion. So there's a separation between illusion and illusion-like, right? That uh, you know, the dream flower is empty of objective existence as much as the flower in front of us that somehow functions, grows, uh, follows a causal, you know, uh, continuum, chain of, chain of events. Uh, but there's still a difference between the two, right? Uh, the dream flower stops when I stop dreaming. It's no longer there. But this, it somehow still functions, even though both are objectively not real. Right? So I think... Again, we have to be careful when we say everything is illusion or s simulation versus saying everything is like an illusion in the sense it's not objective. Yeah. That's my limited understanding. Do you want to add something to that? Uh, 
Uh, no, that's not <laughs> I mean, the notion that there's somehow an actual, another sentient being writing a computer program mm -hmm. that is just a more advanced kind of human, like the way humans write computer programs, I think is, is um, not really, you know, there's not strong reinforcement for that idea in the Buddhist framework, but it's, it's also quite hard to disprove. I would say, <laughs> but I just wanted to say um, only time for one more question, please. Okay. Uh, uh, I think there, yeah, please. Um, it's not physics, and I kind of test and all that, but um, like, would you say that you're studying for this philosophy, or would you say that you are Buddhist, and like, have you taken my vows, or would you consider it, or are you just studying it like, out of interest, or do you feel like the vows were some kind of religion? Yeah, I think I certainly feel devout to it. Uh, I, I would say I'm a Buddhist because I, um, you know, believe in the three, I, I cherish the three jewels, first of all, and then the four... Uh, the, the, we didn't mention this at all yet, ah, but it's, okay. it's the, What's the, uh, English? the four seals. The four, four seals, philosophical, yeah. philosophical seals, seals um, that all composite things are impermanent, uh, all... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. all... <laughs> Contaminated yeah. things are in the nature of suffering. Uh, and all phenomena are empty of <laughs> self, right? And then uh, liberation is peace or something like that. So I think there's some sense. And then, of course, the Four Noble Truths. I think I really believe in those things, that there really is an escape. That I believe that I'm in a suffering state. I do. I think I believe it. I, I haven't fun uh, fundamentally ascertained it yet. But I'm leaning more towards the fact that I'm in a suffering state. And, you know, whether or not I take a layperson's vow and all of that ties into how seriously I want to take my practice, which down the road I might want to. Right now, out of other constraints, I'm not able to just yet. Yeah. Okay. okay, so that, I think we are going to have to stop it here. Mm -hmm. So everyone, please give a warm <laughs>